All right. Good to see you, Brian. How are you doing today? Hi, Matt. I'm good. Thanks for thanks for your time. I'm glad to be here. Cool. Well, um, I think we can just jump right in. Um, we have a really juicy algorithm problem that I've asked at least 50 times. So I've got some pretty calibrated expectations for it. And it's there's a lot of interesting talking points on it. Uh, but enough about that. Tell me a little bit about yourself. Um, hi, my name is Brian. I am a native New Yorker. I taught high school physics for 10 years. Um, I actually have a little bit of background in engineering before that. Um, I enjoyed a lot of things about teaching, but I wanted a career that's a little more dynamic, kind of like use more new technologies and get to learn things um, as you work. So I decided to switch into software development at the end of the last school year. I went into software bootcamp at App Academy, and I've been um, working on projects and applying to jobs and practicing my TSA skills since then. Okay. Uh, what's your favorite project that you've worked that you've worked on? Um, my biggest project is a YouTube clone, so a video player. Um, I designed it to change the comment system. So rather than like comments or a live chat, I kind of combine the two. It's an idea I had when I was teaching online remotely. Um, when the viewers of video make comments, it kind of saves a timestamp in the video of the comment. And then when another viewer is watching the same video, the same comments will appear at the same time. So it's kind of like replicating a live chat kind of thing. And the other viewers can reply to each other. And it's kind of like they can have like an asynchronous conversation as they watch the video. Cool. So the uh, I, I've, see, I've seen that on like SoundCloud and a few other smaller yeah. apps. That's really cool. Um, yeah, threading having having that uh, that's that can be difficult in the UIs and and on the database side too. So, can you tell me about any inter interesting challenge you faced while working on that feature? Um, the biggest challenge the biggest challenge was just getting the timestamp out of the video player because it's kind of like um like a vanilla DOM manipulation pro problem, but then you want to pass it in to a different um, React component. So I had to like look at a lot of different stuff and figure out a way to make it work together, which wasn't really like published online anywhere I could find. So I had to play around with a lot of stuff, but I had a lot of help, so that was good. Okay, so the, the back end was pretty easy, you know, the API figuring out the how to how to send the relationship between all the messages to the front end, that was pretty straightforward for you? Yeah, I basically just added the timestamp as an extra like, you know, characteristic on the comments and then I handled the the sorting and the display of the comments on the front end. Okay. Um, and so how was, um, what did you use for your front end, like UI layer? React, React Redux. Okay. Cool. Um, all right. Well, thanks for the context. And uh, I think we can just, we can jump into the, the code. So if you, if you don't mind sharing, yeah, you're on top of it. Awesome. You can share your coder pad session. So I'm going to give you the prompt and I'm going to let you figure out um, any other information you need to get started on this. Uh, I'll give you I'll give you one example too. So do you know about do you know about query strings? Um, no. Well, if you so if you search on Google, and in the URL, oh. you'll see a little question mark Q equals, and then what do you, what do you search for your query, right? Oh yeah, a little bit. This is the query string. So it's any any URL that has a question mark. Um, the query string is everything after that. But today we're just going to include the question mark in the, the query string. So given this as an input, we want to. I'll make this a multi-line comment. Given this as an input, we want to turn that into an object that looks like this. And the input will be a string. OK. So we have a string. It starts with a question mark. And then there'll be key value pairs. Mm -hmm. The key value pairs are always separated by ampersands. Yes. And the key and the value are separated by equal signs. Yep. OK. Seems 
relatively straightforward to me. Okay. Well, let's jump in then. So I think we have to use um, dot .split to get the pairs. And then for each pair, we could just do dot .split on the equal sign in order to get the key and the value. Can I assume that there won't be any ampersands or equal signs in the actual keys and values? Yes. Yeah, so okay. there's, a, there's like an encoding. Um, so the keys and values will be encoded. And right, so there's a question mark in the beginning. And then as you were saying, each key value pair is delimited with an ampersand. Yes. All right. So I would call this function something like um, query string formatter, maybe like um, format quer query string. It'll take in a string. Um, I'm more practiced in Python, so I'm sure there's a nicer way, but I would just strip off the question mark. Then I would just split uh, ba -ba on ampersand, and then I'll just iterate through key value pairs, split on equals, and then set them in the dictionary or map, as it were. OK. That Does that sense. sound good to you? Yeah. Cool. OK. Um, I don't think it's super time efficient, but I think I can just do slice. Something like that might take off the first character. And then um, I'm not going to modify it, so I'll use const actually. Key value pairs will be just split on the ampersand sign. And then I'll just make a map for my output does it need to be a object or a map or either one well we'll we'll have it as a plain object okay sure then i'll just use for loop And then I'll just break it into a key and a value. Just by splitting on the equal sign. And that'll work, I think, unless there's a weird input that doesn't match the format of string, equal sign, string. But if it does match, then all I have to do is do output key equals value. And then I will return output. OK. I can walk through an example or this example. Uh, yeah, if you could write out a test for this, that would be great. OK. Well, I can just use this input. And then it should print out the same as um, the output over here. Something like that. Might work. Okay. Um. Yeah. Splitting on. Give oh. Okay. Run. You ran it. Yeah. So that looks good. Uh, if you don't mind, I'm just going to get rid of this. Sh should be. So we'll have the actual output as the first 
thing that's printed and then the expected output as a second. Uh, I think it's just a little bit easier to visually read and then I'll do console.clear. Okay. Cool. So that works for this case. Um, do you see maybe any corner cases where this might fail? Or are you happy with well, this for now? Okay, I can save a little tiny bit of time by just putting the slice in here after the um, right before the split. Um, if there were no input, why do you, why, how does that save time? Well, slicing is like O of n time, so it was not like saving amount of time, but it just it does save like one line. Okay, it's just a slightly bit cleaner. Anyway, um, you were asking about. Um, edge cases. Mm -hmm. So I don't think there's any edge cases as long as there's a question mark and at least one pair. Um, but if what if there were no key value pairs? Then would there be a question mark? So great question. So we're going to assume that there always is a question mark, but it's perfectly valid for the query to be empty. So that would mean, yeah, there are no key value pairs. The input would just be a question mark. I think it would be okay then. I, d I don't know the exact specifics of split, but if you pass an empty string to split, wouldn't you just get an empty array and therefore skip the you for can, loop? You can try that out and make sure. Yeah, obviously, yes. Maybe I'm wrong. So just a question mark. Mm -hmm. And then we expect an empty object. Okay, there we go. We got something. Oh, yeah, that kind of makes sense because there's an empty string. All right. So, so that, yeah, that's the edge case that I didn't think about. Okay. Um, so what should I do? Well, I would think that if the key is an empty string, then that's not really a key value pair. Yeah, that's fair. So the key has to be can't, the key cannot be an empty string. Yes. Okay, so I can just skip it. Sure. Well, that's pretty easy. Just go line 22 and only do this if the key is falsy. I mean, truthy. Yeah. I'll try it again. All right. Cool. So I've got a, I've got a feature request. Um, this is perfectly valid with query strings, and I see this. I see this actually quite often. So, if we have, I'm going to modify our one case in the comments up here, so we can also have a key that does not have a corresponding value. So, let's say Baz. In that case, we want the value to default to the string true. The string true. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well, that's a little trickier then because we have to break the input into key value pairs. We get foo hello bar world. Then we get boz with no equal sign. So I would think that you want to go into the for loop and then do one action if the key value pair has equal sign. And then if it doesn't, there's an else statement, it's only something else. So we have to check if it has equal sign. Okay. We could do dot includes. I think that's a little bit, I think that would work fine. I might have to convert to array. I don't remember exactly the JavaScript syntax, but we could do that includes. Um, so there, there, is a, there actually is a redeval print loop on the right-hand side of the screen, that little caret. You can you can type arbitrary expressions in there. I don't know if you knew that. Oh, yeah, but I'll try that really fast. quick and dirty you want to test. Sure. Um, yeah, that seems fine. I don't think it's uh, very slow. Just to get all of n, so not too significant. Um, but I could also like check if after pair of splitting. Mm, 
I think that would work, but I'd rather do something else. I think I'd rather just um, call the pair after I call that split, the split pair. And then the if will be, if the split pair has length two, then it's a key in the value. If it has length one, then it's just a key, and the value is the default value of the true string. Okay, that sounds pretty okay. fine. Cool. So it's a nested if statement. Hopefully it's not too confusing for anyone. But, um, yeah. Actually, I don't think I need this if statement anymore. But let me just finish up the, my, uh, my reasoning before I can move on. Then if the pair length is not two, it's probably one. I can even check that. Just for like a little bit of edge case safety. Then I want to set output key. It's not to be value because we're hoping to be value. It'll be true. I have to change key and value because they're not declared. So actually, it would be split pair zero, split pair one. And I could rename them over here to make it a little clearer for someone else if I wanted to. But I think zero and one are OK for this shorter problem. Sure. And then I'll I'll put the same if statement to check if it's a empty string. That's what I had in mind. Okay, I'll test it again. Something like that might be my test. Okay, sure. I also like that you created a new test instead of uh, blowing away something from previous something we had previously. Cool. Okay. Looks pretty good. Yeah, so that works. Um, before we move on to the next part of this question, because that's a little tricky, I want to push you to simplify the logic that you have in here. So I see some. Absolutely. You know, either redundancies or unnecessary code. Yeah, I don't think I need this if statement anymore. Because if the length is two, I'll definitely have a key and a value. I don't think I need this if exactly, unless there's a weird edge case. OK, sure. So we'll assume that the length is one if it's not two. Um, I could give it the nested if. Well, yeah, yeah. I, th I think I think. Um, well, th does that introduce a regression? Or okay, I'll just I'll right. just um, put it up here. If it's an empty string, then I'll just continue. Okay. So that works too, I believe. Let me give this a run. Yeah. And one more thing too. Do you, do you see any corner cases with this solution? I have to think for a second. Um, I'm taking out the question mark, splitting on ampersands. So after I split on ampersands, I'll have, either key equals value or just keys. Um, it handles key equals value, it handles just keys. I think if there were no ampersands, there's just one, uh, but, um, query, then 
that would be okay. Um, yeah, I think it handles that case. Yeah. I don't see it immediately, unless, like, maybe could the value be an empty string or. The value something could like be that? an empty string. Yeah. Do we okay. handle that correctly? If the value is an empty string, then the split. I don't actually know. Let me check if split gives you an empty string. So. Sure. It does, and that's the value, not the key. So I'm not checking for split pair zero or split pair one. I'm checking for split pair. Did I make a mistake? I think I made a mistake. Well, not really a mistake, but I'm checking if a array is falsy. But arrays are never falsy in JavaScript, I believe. Right. Yeah. So so this this is actually yeah good point. This is this is dead code. Okay. So actually, I do need to um, handle the um, the the edge case inside here, I believe. If not split pair zero, because that'll see the key being an empty string, but the value can still be an empty string. Yep. Um, and okay. So yeah, that that's that's good. So last stage of this part. Um, now, what we can do? So this this is this is once again something that actually is is valid with query strings. This I don't see that often, but it's it's perfectly valid. Um, I'm going to amend our example at the top. I'll have this key value pair. Uh, I'll have a key that appears multiple times. Hmm. Um, I'll say and foo equals again. And now, if a key mul appears multiple times, we want the corresponding value in the resulting object to be an array of all of the values associated with that key in the order that they appeared. Okay. But if it's not appearing more than once, you still want just a string. Yes. OK. Yeah, a little bit annoying, but not terrible. <laughs> it's a little awkward, yeah. But that's that's the question for now. OK. So in here, the simplest way I can think of is just check. Check if output. So I'm going to rename the pair 0. Actually. Yeah, I'm gonna do it just just to be a little bit clear. Um, sure, I'll just say I'll just um, call a key outside the if statement and then inside the if statement. If the length is two, then I can have a value also. Now I'll just change these to key and value. You wanted to do it up here too, right? Yes, thank you. Sure. OK, so sorry, I, I got distracted. Anyway, I'll check if the output s is a string already. If it's a string, then I'm going to do put the string in an array, make it an array. There's actually three cases. It could be a string. It could be an array. If it's an array, you just push it in. And finally, if it's none or null or undefined, I guess it would be. Yeah, it would be undefined. Thank you. 
then that's when you do line 38. Just set it to val the string. OK, I'll code that up. This, I might need a little help. Uh, it's like type of. Yeah, any any kind type of, uh, of awkward type checking. Type oh. checking in JavaScript's a little little funny sometimes. Equal to capital S string. Lowercase. Thank you. Yeah, you got it. And as you were saying before, if it's a string, if it's not a string, then we know it's an array or undefined. Yeah. Right. Oh no, not a val. It would be output key. Mm -hmm. In fact, I should probably check if it's undefined first, because I don't think you can do well. I guess type of undefined would be undefined, right? You could also you could also just check if it e tri strictly equals undefined. Yeah. Okay. There's some some boring historical reasons as to why the type of check is a little bit better, but checking with strict equality is is totally fine. Just okay, yeah. Well, I'd rather do that first, just because that, that makes I think that's the easiest case to check for. So the first thing I'll check is if it's undefined. Then I'll do the last, oh, the last line down here. So if it is a string, it has to become an array. So I'll let new um, new val be an array holding the original string. Then append or push mm -hmm. val. Then I'll just reset the um, output. I'll set output key to be new val instead of val. Okay. And then last case, it should be an array. So all I have to do is push. Like that. All right. That all makes sense. Do you want to test this out a little bit? Yeah, sure. I'm missing a uh, oh, parentheses, OK. And I'll copy the example. All right, there we go. OK, it didn't work. I still got a string. I still just got the overlap, the overwrite. if I hit this branch of the else if statement. Okay. I did. Nuval output.key inside an array. 
Nouvelle dot push val. Oh, this should be Nouvelle instead of val. There we go. That should be good. All right, I think that's good. Yeah. Okay. Um, cool. So now you know all the features we want for this function. Did we introduce any regressions with your changes? I don't think I call format query string inside format query string. Why would you need to recursively call format query string? Oh, sorry, regressions. Um, can you elaborate on that? Regression. Um, so you, we know all the features, right? Um, do we support all the features in all the cases? Or are, is there some corner case where we lost support for one of our features? I don't think so. I think it's OK if you have a double key and an empty string val. I still think you don't want any empty string keys, even doubles still. I don't think you want that. Um, I can't think of any right now. OK. Yeah, it's tricky because we have a lot of branching logic. It might not be immediately obvious what the issue is, but I'll show you a test case that um, has a regression. I'll yes. simplify it too. So if we do foo equals hello and foo, we expect to get true and hello, but I don't believe we do. Ah, I see. So foo is specified twice, but in that case, we're losing the first associated value with foo. Right. That's because we never entered this if statement the second time. We go straight to the else and we overwrite the, yeah. um, what was it, bar? Or hello. OK. Um, I don't think it's super elegant, but I think what we could do, instead of this if else, we can just check if split pair dot length is 1, we can just push in a string true, so it'll always be length 2. OK. Yeah, you can go ahead and make that change. Sure. All right. I'm going to comment it in case I mess it up. Because if it's an empty string, it would also be. Now, if it's an empty string, then the key will be empty. And if the key is empty, it doesn't matter what the val is. So that's OK. So then I'll just do split pair dot push. And then I'll put the true string in there. Um, so if it was an empty string, I'll get an array with empty string. I think that's OK. So this is all. So this will. Take care of that, I believe. It's a little messy. Whoops, just this. But yeah, so if we don't have a value, then we add on the value of true for every pair with every key without a paired value. Mm -hmm. OK. OK. Cool. So that looks good. Um, we have a little bit of time left for this problem, so I think we can go to the uh, the final stage, the final level. Um, all right. So remembering all the features that we have for for this query string parsing, let's build the inverse. So given a parsed query string in the shape of an object, as you saw before, let's create the original query string. OK. Can I call that whatever I want? Just like, I don't know, not format, not parse. Uh, I'll, I'll, leave the, I'll leave the naming up to you, sure. Sure. Make query string. 
and it'll take in an object, um, which I'll call parsed. Maybe not the most clear, but I like it parsed. OK. So for this, we have to go through every key value pair and just add it on to the end of a string in format key equals value, then ampersand between them all. Um, does the order matter? The order, we really only care about preserving the order in the case that a key has multiple values. So we want to preserve that order, but in terms of the order of different key value pairs, we don't we don't care. So you want the bum 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 the keys with more than one value to be together. They don't have they don't necessarily have to be together, but the values for repeated keys have to be in the same order that they were in the uh, the parsed object. Okay, that doesn't seem too hard to me. So I will um, initialize a string, which that's a question mark. Then I'll loop through parsed. And then there are two possibilities. If val is a string, append key equals val. L if it's a, an array for val in val's array. Append key equals val. Actually, we need an ampersand in front of those. But we don't want ampersand for the first one or the last one. So that's that's enough to fix, though. That's my general structure for this problem. OK. Actually, it'd be better to um, make the queries a array and then just join them on ampersand instead. That's a little clearer, I think. All right. Um, if that sounds good, I'm ready to try it. Go for it. If we have yeah. time. Go ahead. Okay. Cool. Empty array. I don't really need to initialize a string. Hopefully, this is the right syntax. Not values, not keys. Is it Entry. pairs? Entry, Entry, thank you. Thank you. Sure. Then I'll push into queries um, a formatted string, or I, I forget the term, but but this kind of string. It would be, well, no, no, I don't need that. Key plus equal sign plus val. Else, I need a for loop. Really, it'd be vowels, not val. So, for every individual value, val, because val is not a single val, it's actually an array of vowels if it's not a string.
And then at the end, I'll just return question mark plus queries dot join on ampersands. So if there's only one val, I'll push in key equals val. If there's more than one val, for every individual val, I'll put the same key equal sign individual val, and they should be in the same order that they were in the parsed object that was passed in. OK, that makes sense. OK, I'll try it up. Can I just pass in? Um, the formatted string for my examples? Uh, well, we need to pass in an object to this. Yeah, sorry. Can I pass in the parsed string parsed by my previous function? Sure. OK, cool. And then one more closing parentheses right there. And that should be the same as the string I passed in to the first function. And I would probably want to do it for all of them, but I just want to see if this works. Let me just log a little delimiter there so it's a little easier to visually parse the test output. Oh, I didn't uh, run the second function. Val is not iterable. Okay, so val could be not an array, not a string. It must have been an undefined, I guess. Well, let me see. Yeah, so how could it be undefined? That doesn't hmm. really make sense, does it? Um, so in this query string, this is the one with the doubled keys. So I passed in this, no, not this into the second function. Um, key val. Val is not a string. So your issue is up here. So oh, instead oh my of gosh. Man, you want Thank you. Of. Yes, too much Python. OK, is that it? Uh, maybe. Whoops, I, I stopped your run, sorry. Uh, foo hello, foo again, bar world, pass true. No, yeah. wait. No, I'm missing the um, the true, the true string. Uh, well, so you're actually adding the true string. Um, for strict compliance, we'd want to, um, in the case where this value is true, to just not add an equal sign and a value. Right. I'll, I'll put that in right now. Then you just want to push a key. Um, and that could also happen here. Yeah. Can you do this without without duplicating the code? Because I I trust you to get it working by putting the without code duplicating the code. Can we, uh, maybe refactor this a little bit and have that feature, the code for that feature, in one place and not two places. Hmm. I mean, I guess I could make these two into the, a similar function. Yeah. Helper function. Like a helper great. function? OK, sure. sure. Uh, 
Um, so this function is going to put key value pairs into queries. Um, I don't know if this is like good practice, but I want to declare it inside the make query string function. Okay. I'm going to use k and v to not reuse key and value because that might get confusing. But it's just if v is equal to the string true, then I'll just queries that push key only. Otherwise, I'll push in key plus equals plus now oh, rv. I, I said I was going to switch to k and v, and I just didn't. Mm -hmm. All right, so I can just change these two lines, or all these lines. OK, so I don't need these two. I will to insert key comma val. And then in the else statements, I'll insert key comma individual val. There. OK. I think that should be good. Um, and we have all of that in there, and we have, yeah, great. Yeah, just switch the order. OK, so we've got the corner cases pretty thoroughly mapped out. Uh, we did touch on one more thing that would be an obstacle if we were to ship this into production or release this as, release this as some, some package that other people would use. Um, yeah, so there's there's something still quite limiting about this this approach. It's not performance. It's not um, it's not performance. So imagine imagine using this in the, in the in the real world and wanting to encode really arbitrary keys and values in a query string. Uh, can you think of anything else that we might want to add to this specifically for the second function? Well, both of them. Really, and this isn't a new feature. This is this is this is a there's still there's still a bug with some inputs, and this hmm. is either like a you know it or you don't thing. Um, I might not. Okay. Uh, so what if I right? So so you know in Google you can you can search for. In, you, in your query, you can have like a question mark, right? But we were saying with the in this problem that a query string is not going to have any question mark in any key or any value, right? So how is, how is that possible? You're saying like, what if someone does search for a question mark? Yeah. What would that look like in the, in the query string? There'd be a question mark. There actually exactly. wouldn't. So there's encoding and decoding. Oh, like um, like percent twenty or something like that. Yeah, yeah. So you recognize it, yeah. So you you know you've you've seen it before. You know this stuff. Um, so I'm down on line one fifteen. There is the uh, encode URI component, and there's decode URI component. So that's your, you know, encode and decode uh, respectively for uh, the code for the the project here. Um. I will scroll up to our first algorithm, and we don't need to add this to both of these because um, I don't. I don't think that's. Um, we we can we can skip past that. But right, so the question mark, uh, the actual encoding for that is. Um, yeah, let me refresh myself. So, encode URI component of a question mark is going to be percent three F. So this, we really want this to be Q mark, question mark. So that's, that's the final, the final feature. Got it. 
well then um but it's but it wouldn't be just percent three like it could be percent three j or something like that right right so so i i i, I told you the the functions that we can use for this so you'll want to use um i'll i'll just show you for it so this encode uri component and decode uri component essentially um right so you, you have your your split pairs here so i'm on line 21 we can just map string start uh map it where we um uh, decode uri component right and i believe that would do the trick yeah and then without that you would of course get the ugly percent three f oh cool so that was built in yeah yeah so that yeah that's a native function you're, you're anytime you want your you have an impulse to build some kind of you know write some something to like escape html or escape things like that on your own like <laughs> that's a really hard problem i would strongly in. strongly advised against yeah. doing that um cool yeah and that works for both um keys and values yeah so we we would do this the way the way that i did this so i did um pair split map decode uri component so this this will um call the function on the key and the value all right great cool thank you so that's the question um thank you for that that was that was uh that was great lots of uh interesting interesting points um and uh you're in a good place too uh for this um what i want to do first is talk about the tell me about yourself uh question and then then we can get back to the algo here yes uh, please okay yeah how, how do you feel the tell me about yourself uh prompt went um maybe i was a little bit too fast maybe i should uh slow down um i've probably done it a little bit too much so i think uh i get a little bored of it um, oh yeah <laughs> that's fair yeah i think i should probably slow down maybe get some uh back and forth going if possible okay yeah back and forth um yeah um definitely back back and forth it can be can be engaging but it's yeah so that that also requires the the other person uh to ask questions and th that little back and forth uh i really yeah i that's a great point um talking too fast um yeah you were almost slurring your words a little bit and i could understand what you're saying and you were still communicating pretty accurately but i think if you were to slow down a little bit uh i don't know take a deep breath or were you were you nervous or just high energy how were you feeling um i think a little nervous yeah okay yeah that's that's totally fine um that that definitely happens um yeah i i think like just physiologically one of the things that i do that really helps me prepare for big calls interviews things like that is to just really give my neurons a break so that can be like go for a walk outside for five minutes or <laughs> stare at a wall definitely don't be on your phone don't be on twitter instagram whatever uh, or x which is it, what it is <laughs> oh my god um yeah just uh you know find some way to to wind down before the the, the interview another really big point too about like the back and forth so your youtube clone project right that's like a massive scope and really interesting and we i wanted to dig into the, your your threading the 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 comment thread feature having like replies and things like that and timestamps uh wait did did you have threads where like one person could reply to another and then one to another and so on and so forth yeah but not if the comments are made at the same time if the comment was loaded before the new person starts before the new person loads a video then yes they can reply okay cool so that's a really juicy problem and i i got the impression that you um as an interviewer in in that exchange i would have i would have assumed that there were you know pretty significant uh technical aspects that were overlooked right so you know youtube scale like of course you're not building something at youtube scale but something beyond um a pet project that would 
support maybe 500 or 50 or like 100 comments, one of the features you're going to need for comments is like pagination. And then when you introduce an, another feature, as we were noticing today with this query string problem, right, you have these, these two different features, like this defaulting to true and then the supporting multiple values, right? Like those features, like when you implement one, you could break the other. Um, so like supporting threads and then supporting pagination and supporting timestamps, like that sounds really complicated. And I was hoping to hear a little bit of, um, you know, interesting technical challenges that you face with either the API layer or, you know, state management on the front end or, you know, the database layer, right? Um, Am I am I jogging your memory on any any challenges? Yeah, that you I remember. Okay. Um, I had to write like a recursive function to display all the replies to a comment. It was a little bit tricky. Yeah. Okay. So it so has been no, quite a while. But cool. Yeah. So so there there was no pagination, right? You just loaded everything. Yeah, it's a it's a scrolling window. It's, there's no pagination. Okay. But does it load? Does it attempt to load all the comments on its own, or will it? will it only do that if the user like clicks you know expand or scrolls down or something um the default is to load them all as the timestamp passes um you can there, there's like a tab you can click a tab to just load all the comments regularly okay yeah so right so obviously like that wouldn't work like at youtube scale and that's okay for a project like this but i think it's also really really important so you don't have to build something that's going to handle all those cases like especially the this massive scale of comments but to really to get like half of the value is to acknowledge that like okay i built this it it handles these two features but it doesn't it wouldn't it would break down once you get past say like two thousand comments for this technical reason and you know, you could explain like, oh, I didn't get to that because, you know, it was a pro it was a pet project or um, I decided not to, right? Like, I, I felt like you were just glo glossing over those those technical challenges. Uh, and I don't know if that's because you weren't aware of them or you um, weren't able to solve them or, or what, right? That, that, that to me felt like a, a blind spot in, in the, the tell me about yourself. Okay. Uh, prompt. Yeah. Yeah. Um, also, um, another, um, I think, untapped opportunity, right? So you mentioned teaching. So you taught physics, right? Yes. Cool. Um, have you taught any of your peers in App Academy or any project that you've worked on, right? Like as, as you're working together, maybe you try to explain something or teach something, like teach how to use Redux or... Uh, you know, pairing on algos, right? Like, yeah, you, there are some times. Tell me, yeah. Can you tell me maybe really quickly about one instance that comes to mind? Hmm. That's also, it's been a while, but I did work on like some, some projects in, in like pairs since graduation that I helped some, some of my old classmates and people yeah. on. So I, I think, I think that's like a really interesting point to dive deeper on. Uh, dive, mm -hmm. to dive deeper into in, in interviews, right? So you have, the, you have this teaching background. Um, a, a good interview, a good, a good engineer is going to, of course, know their stuff, but they're also going to be teachable. And to be teachable, like being able to teach others really helps. Uh, and then, of course, once you, you know, get past the, you know, entry level, junior level, right? You're, you're going to be leveling up your team as you yourself level up and that ability to to teach to you know convey complex concepts um right is, is really important and to, to have that um that other that to have that that expertise in teaching teaching physics is certainly transferable here so i think i think any kind of case study that you can imagine any kind of examples little stories that you can tell um would be super interesting in in that for, in in an interview like this, that's very helpful. Thank you. Cool. Yeah. So you know, it's really interesting projects. I think I think you can just really drive the point drive drive the point home forward by you know telling some interesting stories about how you've taught your peers, uh, and then also getting into the the weeds about some of the technical challenges because like building a YouTube clone, of course, like depending on the level of complexity you commit to. 
is incredibly rich. It's a very rich technical problem. Um, cool. Do you have any questions on that feedback? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Can you expand on on something like um? So that's a really good advice for like the question you always get was like, tell me about yourself, tell me about your background. Yeah. Um, but it's such an open-ended question. Like, how would I know whether this interviewer wants to talk about the technical difficulties or hear a teaching story or talk about something else? Like, yeah, so should I ask a, them directly? That's a great pro uh, great question. So I, I, I'm not sure that I would ask them directly, but right like it's 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 a conversation so you you can there there's there's some signal uh to you of what is interesting to them in either their you know their their facial expressions or questions that they would ask you as you're as you're talking um so i think that pretty much any interviewer would find both of those subjects pretty interesting um it's just that maybe if you get really into the weeds on some technical aspect, say like the YouTube, um, the YouTube comment section, mm, if you were, I don't know, interviewing in like MongoDB, right? That's a database company. Um, they would probably be really interested in how you orchestrated that on the database side. If you were doing this for Facebook, they might be really interested in the interactions between the front end and the back end, right? Like it's there's there's like a there's a context that's a little bit more relevant based on the company that you're talking to. Yeah, uh, that makes sense. Yeah, and, and yeah, it's a, it's a conversation, it's a negotiation. Um, yeah, cool. So great questions um, from y'all, and uh, back back to the algo. What did you, uh, well, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to ask you two questions. So how do you feel it went? Like, you know, strong, strong fail, fail, pass, strong pass. What do you, what do you, what do you think? Uh, I stopped sharing. You want to see it or no? Uh, I, yeah, you, you can, you can keep it up because, um, I'm going to, um, uh, I'm going to be making some code changes um, in in the feedback. So actually, yeah, let's let you know. Let's keep a big picture, and then when we get back into it, I'll have you share again, and I'll show you some code changes. So we still have good time for that. Um, you can see it, right? Um, I think um, logic wise, I did a good job of passing the specs. Um, I think. Like we were saying earlier, sometimes I do talk a little bit fast and uh, could slow down on some parts. You weren't doing that. I didn't notice you doing that on this problem. I think the nerves were worn off a little bit cool. at that point. Yeah. So I did my best to um, lay out some pseudocode before I started, and then I tried to match up my actual code with my pseudocode, and hopefully that was followable. Um, yeah, I think I did well overall but maybe I could have taken a little more time to think of some of the edge cases before I ran tests or something like that. Uh, well, the, yeah, the, the edge cases and help you decide on what tests to write. Um, I agree with that with the caveat that you could have been more proactive about envisioning those test cases. Um, yeah, but how do, how do you feel like objectively how 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 did you feel the interview went? Um, I think I did it pretty well objectively. I think okay. yeah, the question was um, on the easier side of everything I've seen ever. Okay, interesting. Um, cool. So, in terms of right, so you feel f this this question was on the easier side. Uh, do you have any do you have any feedback on the problem? Before I give it, before I get into specifics, I liked it. You know, it's a real world problem. Like I've seen Google search queries before, even though I haven't like really dealt with them. I even knew like the um, the deco URI. I've seen it, even though I didn't know what it was. So it was, I mean, just fine. Nothing uh, too tricky. Okay. Yeah. So so the the intention with this problem is that it's it's quite approachable, but there's opportunities 
for introducing regressions, which you did with um, the format query string and the the other the other problem. Um, yeah, so this one I think is a little bit between like a theoretical like algo leak code style problem and slightly in the direction of like practical coding. Because uh, I, I, yeah, I was saying I, I don't think there is really anything conceptually in terms of like advanced advanced concepts that's that's too crazy here. It's really the challenge is really writing elegant code and having and not introducing reg regressions with each additional phase for the the problem, um, and then envisioning those corner cases along the way. So so this one uh, this is actually quite representative of um, a question that you could see in in an interview. And then the, the focus, as I was saying, would be on envisioning those corner cases, uh, as well as not introducing regressions. You know, clean, clean code. Um, this would be uh, a pass, not a strong pass. Um, and to get to a strong pass, what I would have wanted to see was the proactivity around um, envisioning those corner cases, which you inevitably, which you eventually did. Uh, you you came up with the, the the good corner cases. You were really good about that. You were really good about variable naming. Um, but I am st I'm staring at line thirteen. This without ampersand. This is actually without question mark. But <laughs> that's that's pretty minor minor thing. That doesn't that's, that's not a big deal. Um, yeah. So your code was was really easy to follow. Um, but I once again I did have to push you to like consolidate your code to simplify it. Um, and that's something that I think like proactivity around that would be good too. So like once you get to a working solution, then you can like start thinking about well, like, does this, does this code work? Are there opportunities to, to, to clean this up? Right. There was like the, also the one line of like dead code, right. You know, if not some value that was always an array, um, that was there. Um, yeah. So Right. So really in just like as a high level, um, it was good. There was, there's like a level of fluency with JavaScript here, right? You didn't really hesitate and you were able to like write out your pseudocode. It was pretty easy to follow along and that, that actually you stuck with the pseudocode. I think really just the, the two main things, you know, if you're struggling in your, your interviews is to be proactive about those corner cases and then also if you're, if you get to a working solution, then then look for ways you can tidy up tidy up your solution too. Um, do you have do you have any questions about that? Um, no, that sounds very helpful though. Variable naming core cases. Um, yeah, do you want me to show you a few few opportunities to simplify sure. code here further? Okay. Cool. So um, let's just look at the format query string. So up here, this this is all this is all great. Slicing, splitting, um, and then you're doing this here. Um, I'll just get rid of the commented code for a moment. Um, so this one, this format query string, is pretty tidy. There's really just one thing that I think could simplify it a little bit further, and this is this is just syntax. This is pretty minor. Um, so, okay, so val equals split, player, split, split pair index at one, um, and then this little feature here. So in the case that no value is specified, you want it to default to the string true. Um, so that can actually be done by um, destructuring. So you have this, this thing here, um, and that is... Let me let me put this up here. So you have this. Let's comment this out for now. Um, what you can actually do instead of these two lines of code is you can just do const key val equals split pair. And yeah. if if you want to get this this defaulting to true, then you can just do equals true here. So that nice, if yeah. there's there's no value in the original array, if if this array is of length zero or one, then um, this will get the value true. So you get you get all that functionality there, um, and then if you want, you could even um, 
end line this here. So this is this is kind of like advanced like JavaScript syntax. It's not not a huge deal um, if you don't get that. Um, that tidies that a little bit. Going down to your make query string, um, I'll get rid of some of the code here. I'll push you a little bit to come up with the uh, the idea behind this uh, simplification. Um, okay, so I, I do like the helper function. Uh, I think that's that's quite helpful. Uh, but we still have this like if it's a string, do this. If it's if it's not a string, if it's an array, then do the other thing. Do you think it would be easier if we just could assume that it was an array, like if it was just always an array? Yeah, definitely. Can you make that happen? Um, I don't know if it'd be elegant, but you could do something like. If type of val is string, val equals val. Yeah. Yeah, then you wouldn't need any of this stuff. Yeah, that melts away. This melts away. Yeah. That's cool. Um, and then if you want, you could even inline this logic again. But I think having this as a helper function is, is good, too. Um, cool. So that's the two problems. I'm glad you were able to get through all of the different uh, stages for that. And then this like encode URI component, decode URI component thing. Um, I've asked this question at least 50 times. Um, people have gotten uh, a good amount. Uh, let's let's yeah, I'll give you some truth data. So I'd say about 60% of the people pass this question. And uh, maybe only fifteen or twenty percent get all the way to this like final stage of doing the inverse function. And um, I've only had one other person come up with this encode URI decode URI component, right? So like this is this is like the final the final boss, right? Uh, knowing that, so like this certainly wouldn't fail anyone. Um, but like at that at with problems like this, there like there is there is like a certain amount of domain knowledge that can be useful, right? So this is query string parsing, encode URI component, decode URI component. That's query string stuff. Um, and then like when you when you're seen when you're like a senior level, especially with front end experience, I guess back end too, uh, you're going to be this encoding and decoding is going to be like very top of mind. So this is something that I can th that I think can like separate. Jun it's it's a signal of uh, you know like junior versus senior level um, that kind of thing. So problems can seem easy on the surface, but it's the execution that can really reveal the strength of a candidate. Um, yeah, and and you did execute execute well, um, but of course for there's there's pretty much always room for improvement. Um, do you have any questions or thoughts? Um, how can you tell if um, you're going too fast? Like sometimes I've done interviews where I've seen the problem before and I just remember my solution. Or how can you, um, like, is it generally good to, how do you know when to pseudo code, when to not pseudo code, when to help, make helpers, when to not? Like how, yeah. how do so, I determine like, how fast to go? So, Two different questions. Th those feel like very different questions to me about like helper functions um, and then pseudocode or not to pseudocode or not to pseudocode. Uh, I'll address helper functions. So helper functions is one of the great ways to separate concerns. So on uh, one of the questions that I really like to ask is counting the number of islands, counting the number of square islands in a matrix. So there's this really popular leak code problem counting the number of islands in a matrix. If you add an additional constraint that is counting the number of square islands in a matrix, then all of a sudden people get really overwhelmed with all the corner cases, right? So like you want to make sure that the entire square is, is filled. You want to make sure that outside of that square, it's always water um, or out of bounds. And then you want to make sure that nothing is touching on the corner. Uh, 
there's there's like a lot of corner cases and with a problem like that if you're considering all of those corner cases for each line of code that you write you can be really overwhelmed i've i've seen candidates where they spend the entire hour talking about the problem and writing comments and they don't write a single line of code that's pretty rare but like that's the kind of problem that can do that and that's where the separation of concerns really helps creating different helper functions that elegantly break down the problem where you have this little helper function and you only need to think about well what's the input what's the output what does it do what's the contract um so helper functions i th i my strong opinion is that if there's a helper function that you have thought of and that's useful use it like you know i haven't seen anyone write too many helper functions ever in an interview so if if you can imagine if you can imagine one then then do it in terms of like pseudocode pseudocode is let me let me get a little little bit more general so do you ever feel this impulse to like talk and code at the same time in an interview or not yeah okay so let me replace the word talk with like communicate. So the, um, okay, I, I don't need to do that. So the priorities that I see is priority one is code. Priority two is, priority two is talk. Uh, you can communicate with the code that you're writing or comments that you're writing. And if you're following best practices, you're not gonna be writing a ton of code and not talking at all, even if it's a problem that you've seen before. Right. If it's a problem you've seen before, you still probably aren't going to bang out a solution without any bugs. Um, when you get to when when you the the times where I actually think about like pseudocode is when I don't know what code to write. So if I don't know what code to write, then perhaps I'll write some pseudocode to help break the problem down, or write a helper function and think of the input arguments and out and the return type and what the function does, or I'll write out some pseudocode or I'll talk through what I'm and what I'm trying to do. And then that might help me write some pseudocode, which will then help me write the code. So this, this is all really just on demand, right? So now, of course, there's the clarifying questions and things like that that you want to ask up front. But if you know what code to write, then write the code. If you don't know what code to write, then write pseudocode or talk through it. Uh, but don't try to talk and write code at the same time. That can be um, that can be like counterproductive. Okay, sure. Yeah. So um, pseudocode on demand. Talk uh, if you don't know what to write. Any other questions? Um, no, I think that's a lot. That was very helpful. Awesome. Well, Brian, thank you for uh, for doing this question justice. Uh, you did a great job, and I think uh, with with a, a little bit more uh, targeted preparation for the "tell me about yourself" question, and you know any other other just soft skill questions, you're going to be able to extract a lot of value from your background. And I'm seeing a good level of baseline fluency. I'm seeing a you know, very clear thought process. You're writing pseudocode and you're sticking to that. You're not diverging and writing some other approach. Um, I'm seeing like very good mechanics here. And um, yeah, just to, to, to get from someone that can like pass an interview to someone where the interviewer will, is gonna be, is gonna like fight for you as a candidate uh, the next the next level is to, inv to proactively envision those corner cases and tidy up your code given the opportunity. Um, good stuff, man. All right. Thank you very much for your time and your feedback. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, I hope you enjoyed this mock interview. That was actually a mock interview between Brian, who's a brand new developer. He's trying to land his first position and Matt, who has extensive experience in the software engineering industry. And he actually helps a lot of junior developers prep for interviews just like this. But uh, he actually created his own platform at coachmat.io and you just practice algorithms. And it has a little bit of a twist. It's not so focused on memorizing the algorithms, but more focused on learning concepts. So if you want to check that out definitely do so um, and also let me know what you thought of the interview in the comments I definitely want to hear about it did you love it did you hate it I actually read every single comment so I do appreciate people that take the time to do that and if you want 
to find a community you're looking for a discord community i actually own one um, i'm going to leave the link in the description but it's a junior friendly discord community we have about 2,000 members there and we'd love to have you anyways thank you so much for watching this